And we are live. And hello to Suzanne Slade. Well, good morning, Mel. Okay, I'm here in Israel, and it's uh, late afternoon here. Uh, you are somewhere in the um, hills of New Hampshire. Correct. And it's morning by you, afternoon by me. Uh, I should say, because I'm in Israel and we have a horrific war going on, there's always a chance of having air raid sirens, in which case I will disappear for 10 minutes, but then I'll be back and we will continue as if nothing happened. Um, Suzanne, um, well, I don't know where to begin. 170, 180 children's books. Yeah, well, this has been my full-time job for, I'm coming up on 30 years. So they add up. And, and a lot of them were what's called work for hire books. Those were early in my career. And it, you know, that kind of a book you would get assigned a series of six. And you've got deadlines every two weeks. So those can come out pretty quickly as opposed to the trade books, which is what I do now, which, as you know, is a much longer process of research, editing, finding a home, more editing. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to talk about all of that. Um, we're, and I want to, to speak briefly about your three books from this past year, which are incredible. Uh, I've read them all. Uh, but we want to dedicate most of our conversation to George Gershwin in your marvelous book of, I don't know, about eight years ago, award-winning, multi-award winning book. Um, and it's a, called, I have it here, uh, The Music in George's Head. It, it's a brilliant, gorgeous book. And so one second. So, um, and that, that's because of the centenary of Rhapsody in Blue. So um, let's talk about the three books that you just published. Okay, well, I have them here because uh, we authors love to hold up our books, don't we? <laughs> so, as, as, as you should. Yeah. I've got one called Behold the Octopus, which, as you can tell, has gorgeous illustrations. The reviewers have really talked a lot about the illustrations, but which are by Tom Gonzalez. We've done a couple books together, but it's I, I really this one was fun because the main text is very brief. It's a lyrical brief text. But then uh, describing the actions of, of an octopus, the wonderful things they can do. But then there's more information and, and each uh, in sidebars and then each spread features a different octopus because there are hundreds of beautiful creatures. One, One second, just... the, plural, the plural of octopuses is octopi or octopuses. Okay, you're the biologist, Mel. I, I think it's octopi. I, actually, I think you can use both. I, I'm a microbiologist. Yeah. Octopuses, octopi are way too, too big, big for, for me. Yeah, way too big. <laughs> and, and, and I was going to say, octopuses are nice if you're not being eaten by them. Right. They, they, and they, they, and they, they, they rarely they are, do that. They, they are, but they are carnivores. Oh, yes. They're carnivores. They, they're hunters. They know how, uh, some species know how to use tools, rocks and things. They build dens. They're very smart. I don't know if you've ever seen, you know, YouTube has all kinds of octo videos of octopus and they, um, they're they so smart. And sometimes they're on a boat and there's one video where they're squeezing through a little, they can squeeze their whole body, even their head, they can shrink it down. They're, they're an amazing, incredible, very fascinating. And the way they can change their color and shape, they can, yeah. they can imitate other animals. Yeah, I, so. I, I, I've, I've worried about that frequently. Um, and and is it, can you just show a, a double spread of the book? Oh, yes. Gorgeous book. It is. So, it's, so, oh. uh, Suzanne, some of the people are, um, are watching us. Some of the people are listening to the podcast. And I was so excited to introduce you that I, I forgot to say who I am. Um, yes, look how beautiful this is. That's that's the blanket octopus Um that that's they can use that to scare off predators. They're big blankets. Go go ahead and read it. It's a blanket octopus. Yes. Well, what it's, you know what might be fun um, is just a quick intro of you can get a, a rhythm of how the how the text goes, how brief it is. Amazing octopus, eight long arms swirl and curl through salty seas, hunting. So then there's one word per spread. Uh, along with again the the uh, the sidebar information that talks about how they hunt, you know, building, gliding, my lovely gliding oct blanket octopus, changing, 
and then hiding. So, oh, grasping, hiding. So there's some rhyme in there, but one word is driving each spread, which is kind of a unique, I'm I'm usually quite wordy in my books. So, so this was a different kind of a, a process for me. That's a wonderful. That's a great book. Uh, and of course, if you want to delve into the nitty gritty, uh, you have the sidebars. And uh, back matter. I'm, I've, I've been known as the back matter queen. Actually, at one publisher, I sparked a whole back matter meeting because I had so much back matter that they had to discuss what, you know, what, what makes sense. And, but uh, teachers and students really love that. I mean, if you, if you, if a, if a reader doesn't care to, to delve into all of that or only some of it, it's fine. But if someone really wants to go nuts and <laughs> I always, I don't know, there's always too much, as you know, as an author, you know, I always say I research this much about my subject and I can put this much in a picture book. So I try to squeak in as much of the rest of the good stuff in the back matter as I can. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm I'm not a back matter a queen or king. Um, I add back matter when I'm forced to, um, but that, that that's okay. Um, so let's uh, before we segue on to, to your next book that just came out, uh, I forgot to say who I am. So I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. And that is why I'm here with the wonderful multi, multi, multi author, Suzanne Slade. So now you had a book that just came out this month with Sleeping Bear. Oh, yes, yes. Um, some uh, days uh, well, 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 we should name the uh, publisher. Is that a copy uh, book? The, the octopus one? The octopus is Peach Tree. Peach Tree. Peach Tree. And we've got Behold, the Hummingbird is coming out in April, a, a sequel, if you will. Okay. Um, this one, uh, Some Days Are Yellow, that just came out in April. This is Sleeping Bear Press. I love it. They do who, gorgeous, who, gorgeous who, who, books. Who edited this? Um, this is Barb McNally. I love Sleeping Bear. They're they're excellent. I do too. And, Their books are and, beautiful. And and this is this is a, a such a lyrical Suzanne. Yeah, this this and, is and lyrical. the illustrations are marvelous. Yeah, the illustrator, Michelle Lee, she also illustrated a book that came out this year by George Takai. I don't know if I'm saying his last name right. Ours, um, from uh, Star Trek. If that, I'm not a Trekkie, but- um, I'm, not gonna, a, I'm not gonna correct you. <laughs> he, he had a wonderful children's book out. So Michelle also illustrated his. But this book is kind of fun because it, it, it highlights how days are different, you know, how, as we all know, as uh, on this journey of life, and some days, you know, just you, you think are going to be great. Some days have these surprises that are really fun or not so fun. And this book kind of addresses those types of ups and downs of all everyday life. And at the end, you know, as you're always thinking, what's, what's my ending? What's the big finish, which is that every, you know, tomorrow's brand new. So no matter if you had a fantastic today or not so great today tomorrow's brand new and it's all new and you don't know what adventures are, are coming so that was I, I i really enjoyed working on that book read um, please suzanne read a bit of it it's 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 okay. it's so lyrical it's, it's gorgeous and i you know i must say there's lots of books on the same genre but correct you found, this is a... but, but you found such a voice here read a little bit okay so we start out some days are yellow Others feel blue. Some days are me, others more you. Read the Some dessert are... one. Oh, you want the dessert one. All right. He, he's got something. He's all right. Let's see if I can get there. I think I'm this lead. So some days take thinking. This is so cute how this child, of course, is the, the engineer in me loves that they're drawing up this, this uh, birdhouse and treehouse and um, others need heart. And here we have a little bird. Actually, a friend of mine, uh, she just was saying she was reading it to her grandchild and they were had so many questions. What happened to the bird? What happened? To... Okay. And some days take thinking, others need heart. Oh, some days are fast, others seem slow. Some days are yes, others all know. We've all had the, the no days. Um, I didn't, oh, here we go. Some days are rain, others clear sky. Here comes what you wanted. Some days are some spinach. Some days are spinach. Others, Others cream, cream pie. pie. <laughs> I love it. 
So I, 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 I'm personally a lemon meringue pie guy, but oh, um, buddy. I can. I love pie so much I couldn't even begin to pick a favorite. I think pie could be my favorite food group, really. So we we need a book on pie. Ooh, how about a book on on pie and pie? Oh, three point one four one five nine. Yes, dude. At least, at, yeah. So so the well, pie and and the pie. And there's Pie Day, which would be a big day to promote the book. <laughs> Maybe you and I are going to do that together, Mel. I, I think you I may. Would, have... I would. I would be honored. Okay. All right. We will be. We will be workshopping that when we're done here. Oh shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so Suzanne, um, it, now the book on, on Vera Rubin. Do you have it with I... you? <laughs> <laughs> and there she is. Yes, this is a beautiful, this is a Calkins Creek. You came out of it. nowhere, came out of the dark. Yes, Shining Star, Vera Rubin discovers dark matter. And um, I am a, I have a mechanical engineering degree. So I am official, you know, woman in STEM. So one of my favorite subjects is to write about other women who just made phenomenal discoveries, Vera Rubin being one of them. Um, and this is where, as we were discussing back matter, I really not to shortcut the storyline, but I can show you an example of where, so I get to do my author's note, right? And write more about Vera and include actual photos of her as a child or young woman using uh, various telescopes. Cause I love using uh, actual photos. Although the illustrations are, are just phenomenal. There's nothing like seeing the person for, you know, for the child to see the person, this is Vera and a timeline is always lovely to, but just more about it, you know, everything. And and I always talk to experts when I uh, write the nonfiction. So I get to acknowledge these, you know, very smart people who help me out. So that's back matter is always a fun thing for me. <laughs> At least for one of us. Uh, no, I, I, look, it, you know, I was a scientist for, I don't know, 35 years or something. It's like the, the nonfiction. I, I interview a lot of nonfiction people. Uh, by the way, Lori Walmart uh, must be a, a, a friend and competitor of yours. Not a competitor, but a good friend. And yeah, we've we met up at an NSTA, National Science Teacher Association. And, and I, I've had lots of uh, I've had lots of. You had Melissa that, Stewart. Melissa Stewart. And, oh, it's and, wonderful. And Jen, and Jen Swanson and 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 many oh, others. She, I'm forgetting. And, and Jennifer and, Byrne. Jennifer Byrne. Jennifer who, Byrne, who of course, who introduced, who introduced us. us. Yes. And her book on tell. Einstein, yeah. And and the, how the uh, how the sea came to be, uh, brilliant. Um, so, uh, but this uh, this is about you now. Um, and so I, I was just saying that you know, after so many years of trying to be a nonfiction guy, I want to be a fiction guy now. And 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 so it, seeing your work and how you're able to to morph and segue from one to another is really special. So um, just a few more words on this, uh, on this book, who published it and the- um, and, Oh, uh, The Shining, Shining Star with Calkins, yes. Yes. Um, and, and the illustration, Susan Reagan, um, I do have to, she, and not only are they beautiful, but you, you would be surprised maybe to know the amount of research the illustrators do on these types of projects. And I will also do, you know, I will be looking for um, anything that's historically inaccurate on a, a drawing and, you know, on the, on say this, this large telescope that she used. And so it's, it's quite a, a balancing act. I think when we're creating these nonfiction books that they're so gorgeous, but yet factually you, we really, go over every detail of the illustrations here the you know the type of scope and where it was and um and the experts help as well with that but i'm i'm in awe of illustrators like susan who can just they're just drop dead gorgeous to look at yet if you, for anyone who knows about the the science behind it they can see that they're actually accurate illustrations as well and 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 she fought um fiercely as many oh, yeah. uh female scientists uh, did to um to achieve her fame and glory and then at the end at the end of the day uh she didn't get a nobel prize no yeah here's a woman who 
early on in her career, uh, women weren't allowed to use some of the big telescopes. And she finally, as you said, had to fight her way there, had to, you know, took not only like a woman like Vera, very bright, very self-motivated, uh, works hard in her field, but then has to contend with these other obstacles placed in her way. She, the one um, observatory, there was no women's restroom. <laughs> So she makes a sign, draws a little stick figure of a woman, sticks it on the door, you know, and that just had to be a lot of um, challenges to overcome. And yeah, and then she discovers all this evidence for dark matter, which which is huge. Um, and yeah, was not recognized with a Nobel Prize, which many thought she should be at that no, time. And, and, and initially, it, you know, people said, oh, this is, uh, this is bullshit. Uh, which, which right. very often happens when you when you discover something. She she reminds me uh, of Rosi Franklin, um, who uh, also was Jewish, who was also denied a, a Nobel Prize, um, and um, it's, it's very sad. But but uh, your, your your book is gorgeous, um, and uh, congratulations. Oh, <clears throat> now let's let's talk about. Um, Let's talk about Suzanne and how you got to Gershwin. Ah, how I got to Gershwin. So, <clears throat> you, you have to, was, excuse me. Well, I have an octopus in my throat. That's um, okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Mel, I I will always say students ask, you know, where do you get your book ideas? And I never go looking for book ideas. They always find me. And George Gershwin found me on uh, July 4th, I let's say 10 years ago-ish. And I was home, I was watching our local PBS, Chicago PBS channel, and they had a 4th of July, uh, they were showing fireworks and things. And in the background, Rhapsody in Blue was playing. It was just lovely, right? And then the, the narrators start talking about how uh, George had written the song specifically for this um, event that Paul Whiteman, a band leader, has put in called an experiment in music in New York. And it was to be this, all this, wild crazy new kind of music this weird thing called jazz that no one a lot of musicians were saying wasn't real music you know well anyway they're talking about he wrote it for that and then his first performance was 1924 100 years ago exactly 100 years ago two weeks ago it right in new york aeolian hall and but george with this pressure of you need to write a, a piece for this particular event on this particular day there was some stress behind that and he was struggling to come up with something but he started hearing sounds like he got on a train and it's the book of the rattledy bang rattledy bang rattledy bang of the train that got him and all of a sudden he could see and hear this composition but the part that really struck me was when he went to perform this okay it's finally the big performance all these musicians have all their sheet music that they're following. But George has no sheet music in front of him on his piano. He is just playing, as the book alludes, the notes in his head. So I just thought, number one, the song, of course, is so iconic and is so, um, I don't even know words to describe it. It's, it's, I think you said in your email, changed your life, Mel. It did. You know, it's. Uh, so the song itself, and just to hear the background, I thought a book about how that that composition, how he wrote that composition, and then the of course the big finish is him performing it at this big experiment in music concert. The people in the in the audience are falling asleep. He's he's almost at the end. He's the next to last performer. People are falling asleep, literally in their seats. Some are getting up to leave. They sit down and that first, you know, ooh, you know, and and everyone's like, what is happening? And and music history was made right then and there. <laughs> and so on. Um, Lovely. Yes. Um so you know, I, I, I grew up with Rhapsody in Blue, and even I didn't know, uh, and I learned from your book about this uh, clarinet player that uh, who, who, who um, as a kind of a, um, a lark, yeah. uh, did it. 
And I thought Gershwin had written that in, and there you go. Yeah, and 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 as soon as Gershwin heard, he said, oop, uh, we're keeping that in there. You know, just how this piece was so fluid, really, because that was at the rehearsal right before the concert. So it was always in, fl I mean, then for him to sit down, and I, I, I wonder if each time he performed it, it was a little, his part anyway, was a little different. I don't know that for sure, but one would wonder if he's not using music. It's a it's a gorgeous book. You don't happen to have it on hand because it's in Chicago. Right, right. But um, there's a but, lovely um, reading as as I sent the link to you. The Chicago. Yes, I know, but I, I want people to buy the book. It's still available, oh. right? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> it, it, it's a gorgeous book in blues and browns and sepia and and um, talk about the illustrator for a minute. Uh, um, it's it's yeah. a genius book. The, the words and the illustrations, I've never seen anything like it, how they how they blend, or should I should say, I've never seen anything like that where the author is not the illustrator. Yeah, yeah, Stacy Innerst was the fantastic illustrator, and he is a musician as well, which was certainly a bonus. You know, the art directors often try to pair up someone who has some kind of a background, and so he was the perfect illustrator for this project. And he, as you say, Mel, um, created palettes of blue. See, I'm not an artist, so I may not use the right artistic words, but it's in blue tones, which is just incredible. And then there are words in the text where I talk about when George was young, you know, classical jazz um, and he, the blues, and those words are put in a certain kind of a, a handwritten font type which I had done something similar in the manuscript. In the manuscript, I had put each of those in a different color and font. And then in mine, I combined them to make Rhapsody in Blue, the letters. It was kind of a weird thing. So, 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 so Stacey yeah. Sorry. Took, took that kernel of an idea and made it much, much better. Yeah. So so you saw this uh, you saw this show on PBS and you hadn't grown up on Rhapsody in Blue as I, as I did. And, um, and you said, oh, I have to write a book about this. Yeah, that's but, exactly. But, but you're, you're, are you a musician? Oh, well, I play piano. I was in choirs, but well, not. Wonderful, not. wonderful. I thought you were an engineer. So now is a good, I, I, I want to segue <laughs> now into Suzanne's life. So now Ooh. we're going to go back to the age of zero, run us Ooh. through Suzanne, how Suzanne. you became a mechanical engineer, worked okay. on all kinds of cool systems. Yeah. And then, and then gave it up. Well, Basically, I just always liked math. You know, I, I'm I'm the the older I get, the more I really recognize the the influence of genes, the gene pool that we receive <laughs> at at age at Suzanne at age zero. And for whatever reason, I seem to get a math science gene. And even in first, well, why, grade, why do you say that? I looked at your website. You were writing books from the age of six, dear. You yeah, forgot. yeah. I mean, when the teacher the thing I reminded you. Yes, I did. Uh, when my teacher in first grade, that was my first story. She said, "What would you do if you found a candy tree? A tree that grows candy?" And oh, buddy, I had a lot to say about that. But a lot of misspelled words. <laughs> Basically, my story was about not telling my brother and sister because they would get too many cavities. There was, I, I think, it was a bit of a worry wart. <laughs> but, but that said. That was first grade, but what what I was doing most of the time in first grade, because my teacher, Miss Hudson, it was her first year as a teacher, and I mean, she might not have been as structured as other teachers. I loved her. I would take my math book and I would go and sit in the coat closet and I would do my math book because it was the back, you know, when you could write in the book. And then I finished the book and I said to her, oh, I finished this. And she goes, oh, here's the second grade math book. So I went back in the coat closet and I worked, I finished that and I, whenever, I came, I said, oh, I'm done with this. She goes, okay, here's the third grade math book. But that that's the age where you get to the book that you can't write in, that you have the problems in the book and you put the answers on a piece of paper. And when you're in first grade, I was like, I don't get it. How, the, how this, <laughs> so then she, had, she wrote a letter home to my mother and said, Suzanne will now be a math helper for the rest of the year because she's finished the two books and doesn't like the third grade book with the, <laughs> but Anyway, I just, and I have to admit, writing was my least favorite subject all through school, through high school. I, and I was a big reader, huge reader, but writing to me felt very gray, if you will. Like when I, 
would do in physics or chemistry or whatever in high school if the answer was 4.79 millimeters you even, i mean you even know how many significant digits right that is the answer and I, it's very clean it's very definite it's very neat they would say write a paper on the theme of this book well i'd go oh i could write this or i could write this or and my younger brain was like i don't know what's right and that bothered me so and now as a writer, which I do love writing now, um, that just shows how as we grow older, right? We change, we, we, I still love math and science, but this is something that I love using the creative side of my brain. As you said, you're liking switching from the nonfiction to the fiction. Um, so I just, and, and since I was not, did not have writing in much in high school or college in engineering in college, you don't take any writing classes, um, I had a lot to learn. So I, I went actually went back to college at night as a, as a young mother. I was a stay-at-home mom and I took a class on writing books for children. And I had Emily, a whole- you, 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 you became a mechanical engineer and we all right. know how difficult these studies are. Uh, where did you study? Um, uh, Valparaiso University, it's in Indiana. You have to study all kinds of things, Fourier transformations, um, fluids, dynamics, fluid dynamics, um, electricity, Materials. electronics, um, calculus, my, calculus, differential equations, oy. thermodynamics. The, the Jews say oy vey. And, no, I enjoyed and, it. And, <laughs> no, okay. I, I, look, people are different, right? Um, right. Uh, I, I can't say I enjoyed it. I used it afterwards, but I didn't enjoy it while I was studying it. And, and good for you. And then you actually became a mechanical engineer and you worked on spaceships and I don't know what. what worked, you worked on, on rockets out in California. I worked for McDonnell Douglas Space Systems. I worked on yeah, Delta Titan rockets, Delta Star spacecraft. And then I moved into the automotive uh, field and I worked on Brake boosters, the things that make your car stop, as I tell kids school visits. Um, and I enjoyed that. There were I enjoyed, I think I I think I like challenges. I like learning new things. And I was, you know, and that's kind of when you're an engineer, you become a mechanical or electrical or whatever. You learn the basic uh principles and classes, but then when you get into your job, you have to learn the specifics of whatever field or vehicle or whatever area you're in automotive aerospace whatever it might be so so uh, then, no, you know, I, 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 I i'm i'm in awe suzanne and and you gave all this up for fun so so how did you make <laughs> how did you make the transition from being serious uh to being less serious well the transition came uh in one july when uh when we adopted a three-day-old baby girl and i became a mother and then about 12 months later, I gave birth to our son. So now I'm a, I'm a busy mom. And I just, I decided I would stay home and um, take care of my children. And then as I'm reading them, stacks and stacks of picture books, which was, has always been my favorite genre of children's books. And uh, when I was young, I would join the summer reading club at the local library and I would take home as many books as I could carry and so reading to them and I thought oh wouldn't that be fun to write children's picture books having no idea what what mountain lion <laughs> but the journey began and it was slow as it is for you know many authors and so classes conferences joined SCBWI and it took eight years to get my first book contract Hold on a second. So one of the things, most of the people that I speak to, and this is also my story, went to SCBWI and, and, and like the world opened and they said, okay, there is a path because, you know, we, we, we went to university, we got degrees. You want to be a mechanical engineer. You, you study mechanical engineering. Right. Very, very few universities, I, I don't know if any, have a bachelor's degree in, in writing children's books. Uh, they have master's, but not bachelor's degree. Um, so this was the revelation for me. You know, there is there is a, a path. There are things you can study. I didn't know that until I was quite old. Right. It is becoming an author is not a traditional path because yeah, you could get an English degree, a journalism degree, but 
to be an author, it's your own, it's your own path. You have to be motivated. You have to not get discouraged. You have to keep being willing to learn and to, it, but, yeah. But, but in, in, in picture books, you can, you know, I, I feel that I could have had a degree by now in, in picture books, if there were such a thing. Uh, so much to learn. So um, much to learn. And, and, and you know, for non-writers though, like you, the best written picture book, you pick it up and you read it and it flows so well that you would say, boy, this would, this would be easy to write. That's, that's the mark of a good book. But what appears to be the easiest to write was actually probably just painstakingly, you know, it's a, it's such a slow process. Yeah. So um, how did you, um, uh, after eight years, get your first book published? How did you find an agent? How did you break in? Um, the people who write uh, picture books that are traditionally published are one in a thousand, one in 5,000. And people like you who have gone on to have many, many wonderful books published and won awards as you have um, are like one in a uh, million. Well, yeah, I, I think I've heard. Well, how did that happen, Suzanne? Okay, so how it happened, I told you about the, the class at night, the STBWI, the conferences, the all, you know, all of that. I joined several critique groups. So I'm slogging along for eight years. And it's just been the slowest. It's just been incremental. Writing gets a little better, learn a little more, gets a little better. And I went from, this is back in the days when every submission got a rejection letter. You know, nowadays it's the policy is kind of like, if you don't hear from us, you know. But back in the day, um, I started first, I was getting the dear author, thank you for your story, we don't want it. Okay, then I started getting the dear Suzanne, thank you for sending us the inventor's secret. It was really nice, but we don't want it. Then I got dear Suzanne, thank you for sending whatever. Would you consider revising a little and sending it back to us? I could see, so each of these steps to me was a big win, was a big encouragement. Wow. Yeah, for sure. And were you working with a critique group? Yeah, I had several critique groups. Um, I I didn't have an agent for many, many years. So I broke in on my own. Um, so my first, we talked about early on the um, work for hires. While I was working on my picture books, I also had become very aware of the straight up nonfiction books. You know, you see in the children's summer photo illustrated, summer illustrations. And all of a sudden it kind of clicked with me. I thought, now I have this science background. What if I tried to leverage that? And, and I'm fascinated by science topics and write up some samples, which I did, sent them to the work for hires and said, listen, I have this engineering degree. I'd be happy to write on any of your upcoming topics. And that became my breakthrough was a series of six books on atoms, uh, chemical reactions, the periodic table. It was, these were page turners, I'm telling you. Uh, so that was breaking in. And so I started doing a great deal of the work for hire. This, and was, then this was unagented still? Yes. Yeah. And they liked my work. So they kept giving me more and more. I was, I would write. I think one year I wrote like 32 books in a year. It was, it got very busy. And then another, I got picked up by a different, another work for hire. They were having me do biographies, which was really fascinating. And as I'm doing this, my writing, I'm learning more about research, about writing, about working with an editor, about now those types of books, you're very, you're looking at word level, you know, to keep to a certain reading level, word count. But all of that, was very helpful and I learned about different people and subjects and I started getting other ideas for topics to write in my trade picture books and then finally broke in with a, a very a smaller publisher Arborddale was my first trade book sale also without um, an agent without an agent and then I then I think I got a book with Charles Bridge then with Peach Tree just kind of uh Calkins Creek um, yeah. Un, un, unagented. Correct. Yeah. I, you know what, my, my mantra became write something so good that when they find it in that slush pile, they're going to take notice. I, my job, I have to write something that they cannot, that they, that stops them and they will. So I, I, really Suzanne, I, I was thinking about that 
this morning that in order to break in, you have to write better than what they have because you're not a name. You right. know, the people I'm interviewing like you, okay, um, you're a name, Suzanne Slate. And for people who are in the process of breaking in, they actually have to write books that are at least as good as yours. So that they'll be well, more. And, and I, I have to, I mean, just because if, I mean, you think I have a name, I don't know, but I, I don't, I think I still have to, I still get plenty of rejections and I still need to really, I have to have a very compelling, interesting subject that young readers, you know, and, and I have to write in a way that's really clever and, and with a thread draws people in that's very engaging. It has to be factually correct as I, I still have, you know, people say I've had friends who are not in the business say, oh, now they'll just buy. I said, no, you <laughs> but I did feel that it, it was almost a good thing. I think it was a good thing when I was um, early on. I was like, I, I would just tell myself, this has to sparkle, you know, sparkle, shine, and and do everything so that when that whatever editor finds it in that slush pile, they're going to be like, whoa, this is really interesting. You know, that, I've got to, mm -hmm. I've got to really catch their attention. Which manuscript was this? Um, well, the very first with trade was Animals Are Sleeping, and that was with Arbor Dale. It was just a you know, a little lyrical. Um, then there were just other, the Gershwin one was my first one with Calkins, um, and that was unagented. Uh, so, you know, and, and of course, finding these fascinating people like George Gershwin who do these amazing things, that's, they're the ones <laughs> bringing all the sparkle and shine, and I just have to present it in a way that's engaging and clear for, for young readers. Well, what, what I love about your Gershwin book is it's not it's not only about George Gershwin. It's not like only a biography. It's just as much about his music and about the story of Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah, yes, that's because you can that's the thing you can find, especially when you're writing biographies, is I'll I'll stumble upon someone like, okay, I first have to see are there any books about this person? If not, like I have a book about the Harlem Globetrotters. That was an, actually that was another PBS uh, special. Now, I would have thought for sure there were books about the Globetrotters, and there weren't. I was stunned. So that was so. Then I can really tell the story I, that I feel should be told about you know. But if there is a, a book about someone, you have to say how is mine? How can I do something different or unique that? brings another aspect to this person's life that this, the existing books did not. But you have a Dolly Parton book. Dazzling yeah. Dolly, yes. and there's, there's other, I don't know if I should be the one to tell you, but there's other picture well, books from Dolly Parton. Well, here's the other thing about the pipeline of children's picture books. When I wrote and sold the Dolly Parton book, there were no other picture books about Dolly. So as you know, there's a picture book on average is kind of three years in the works. Maybe the Dolly Parton one, I think we were able to get out in two, but um, yeah, but, but they're like my, the book that I wrote about her, I, I was very captivated by the fact that she uh, had stage fright as a young girl. Who would have thought, I mean, Dolly, who's just was wearing a cowboy's bikini outfit at a football halftime show she did would, would have had stage fright. But she, I thought that was, a, and something that children today could relate to and it could. So I, I focused on that aspect of her life and that was a, a struggle she had to overcome, but she had such passion for singing. She had to overcome that to pursue her dream. So different books share maybe different facets of a person's life. Incredible. So uh, how did you find uh, Karen Fox, uh, your, we, your, your wonderful agent? Yes, she's very wonderful. We, I, um, in SCBWI in the Chicago area where I live part of the year, I was on a committee every year that put out um, a conference called Prairie Writers and Illustrators Day. It's in November. And it's a one day, but it is a long, big, full pack day. But Karen was one of the agents we had as a speaker. And we just happened to sit next to each other at a meal and then another meal. And we were just talking. And um, 
that kind of organically happened. Yeah. And you already had a couple of uh, books. Yeah, I had, I think I was had worked with at least, I don't know, seven, eight houses at that point. Yeah. Um, each one was a slow, you know, getting into um, sometimes fortunately to live near Chicago, there were a lot of the big book shows um, that would happen down at McCormick Place. And before I was published, I would go to those and I would go to the different publishers booths and meet and, you know, might I might need an editor, I might not. But um, I remember meeting Kathy Landwehr um, from Peachtree. And I, she had looked at the Gershwin book, I believe, at that point. Um, but anyway, then then we had met face to face, you know, some of things like that. If they've seen your work and like it and then they meet you, there's more of a connection maybe on the next. Story. Yeah, but, but, you know, Suzanne, after after uh, your initial uh, sales, you know, um, Charles Bridge, uh, you could start you could have found an agent at that juncture. Uh, I tried and I Re really, oh yeah, mm -hmm. no, it's, you know, agents are very busy people and they can only take on so many people and yeah, but I, I do feel like that made me, I had to really hustle and work and find these editors and I would customize each query, you know, each cover letter with each submission for that editor. If I'd met them somewhere, if they'd considered they made a nice comment on a previous story of mine. I always tried to connect um, with the editors in that way. So coming back to now, uh, what really interests me is, I mean, everything about your writing interests me. Um, the the so-called dichotomy between the nonfiction, the STEM, uh, and the fiction, and you know, uh, writing, um, and, and some of the people I interview whom I love, uh, you know, they, they want to write biographies that um, are real nonfiction. They don't want to put words into the mouths of dead people that they might not have said. Um, and, then, and then there's people like me who say, eh, write a good story. Semi-fiction, nonfiction, informational nonfiction, informational circus fiction. It's the story, folks. Correct me, please. Well, if I'm writing a biography, a nonfiction biography, I am only going to share facts. But the trick, I'm not, I will not put words. I do have dialogue, but I found it. So if there's dialogue, if there's quotation marks around something, it's, it's, I found it and I've got the source in the back to show readers where it came from. That's, that's the way I roll. Uh, other authors will do it differently. And that gives them more freedom, you know, to to add, you know, but it's all fact. But but the trick is what I try to do is take these very compelling, interesting facts. But then as I'm presenting them, I try to do it. I've had people say, oh, your book is fiction about they think it's fiction. And that's is very complimentary to me that it reads like fiction. But I'll say, well, it's not fiction because everything in there is true. But the way it's presented like in the Gershwin book, I think, I, I don't know why this came to mind, but as people are rushing into Aeolian Hall to hear that big concert that George's been working on his composition for, I said something like, hurried feet pound out staccato beats as they're, as, as they're going into the hall. I now, love I love that. And it, I think that kind of reads like fiction. It feels, it feels fun. And it's, you know, it's, it also has that musical. This We've got staccato, so we're, we're talking musical. But... It's that's nonfiction. People were in a hurry. It was cold. They were running inside. But in, instead of saying people hurried in, I tried to find some lyrical, clever, whatever words that make it feel like you said it's about story. It's it's yeah, no, no, it, 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 it's it's lyrical nonfiction. Yeah, I would. I love I would, that. Yeah, I love it. Betsy Bird, we need a new category: lyrical <laughs> nonfiction. Um. And, and and so okay, but I, I'm. It's like, um, uh, you know, for for us Jews, you know, keeping kosher and keeping almost kosher. Uh, <laughs> Keep us kosher um, here, Mel. No, I, 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 um, I. We can have a discussion, but we, we we don't know each other well enough because you know, as I said, um, 
Well, let's have a little bit of this discussion. Okay, so George Gershwin was a very complicated person. Yes. Okay, and and you can write a story, a nonfiction story, that will have only things he said, and only things he did, but it, it won't have all the things he said or did or thought. Correct. Um, and then we get into, um, you know, how I I feel as a scientist that. Scientists pursue singular truths, uh, but 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 truth is a very complicated thing. And um, I, I applaud you, um, and I applaud my other uh, colleagues and friends uh, who, uh, when they write nonfiction, you know, they write nonfiction. But it doesn't really bother me, right? If um, if they're writing about somebody who um, who says who, who burps at the dinner table and might have not have burped that same evening. It doesn't bother me that much. <laughs> and it's nice that it bothers you. I like that. Well, different. Yeah, every I think every writer has a different style. And but, and also, I know the editors, the main editors that I've worked with, and I know that they, they would uh, also not want to put in <clears throat> something that hadn't happened. Now, you, now, I have, I think I have one, oh gosh, which one was it, where I had to kind of put a disclaimer, where I said, wait, there was... Oh, you were just saying about what a book could say, what George Gershwin said. In in that example, there was very little primary source of any dialogue or George's own personal writings because I wanted to put more quotes in than I was able to. So some people, there just simply is not that information available. Then other people like Vera Rubin, she wrote a book about her life, wonderful book. So I had so much material to 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 look at and to she did interviews i i watched um all these different interviews she did so i had so many quotes reams of material but gershwin there that did not exist and it and if it if it wasn't recorded then it will never exist <laughs> so we have some people you have a lot to work with some you have a little and i don't know what rabbit hole i went just went down but where do, where were we on this no, topic because, well, we're talking about uh, what you've done, which is strictly kosher nonfiction, and right. you you cited Gershwin based on an interview that he had in the early 1930s. Yes. So it's it's all verbatim according to this, and um and I think it's lovely. But I'm saying just just me. Um, I yeah. really I, I I really don't care um, if the author takes a few liberties as as long as it's clear to the to the reader, right. yeah, that he might he might not, he might not have burped on that particular evening. Well, and I've seen that at well. Sometimes in a subtitle, it'll say like the mostly true story of so and so, and then in the author's note, they'll give the, that, the does that bother you? No, no, no. And then there's a disclaimer, and I did I I can't remember which book I did the disclaimer in, which said no one knows, we don't know. So I did have to make some. I don't know if it was Susan and Frederick, which was about Susan, Anthony and Frederick Douglas. They were best friends for 50 years. And maybe it was that one. There were some things that we just couldn't find. And so I just was flat out, hey, here I I just made some assumptions. So that so I think that's okay as long as everybody fesses up and we know it. I think it's wonderful if you fess up. Yes. Suzanne, we are we've now talked for 50 minutes and time has flown by. Flown and by. I'm gonna I, I want to have you again in a few months. Um, and uh, so what I want to ask is what I haven't asked you and uh, some advice for aspiring authors that we haven't mentioned already. Yes. Okay. Well, definitely get in a critique group. Um, and uh, we're not talking about your mother or your child here. We're talking about other writers. I All my critiquers, we're all unpublished. You don't need big famous, you know, but uh, people who are walking this same journey with you, trying to do the same craft, and they don't even have to be in your same genre. My current critique group, some of us, one just specializes in rhyming picture book. One is more, um, you know, some do middle grade. So, but just someone, and then it's just that, that new, fresh set of fresh eyes, because sometimes you can totally miss. I've had stories where I, I'm just heading down a path, my little engineering brain, and I had one where they, I took it to a critique group when we actually, people were howling, they were laughing. They they thought 
what I had written was kind of absurd. They, they said, is this a joke? Like I had kind of missed something big that I had done that was really kind of silly. And so <laughs> critique group. Um, also setting your- Okay, I, I, I don't know how silly you are. I once wrote a story about a kangaroo uh, with, a, with a pouch um, named Ken. And I'm a biologist. And somebody said to me, Ken has a pouch. He's the only male kangaroo in the world that ever had a pouch. The pouches are female kangaroos, Mel. Love it. Yeah, you can. Well, well, the fiction, sky's the limit. No, no, I, 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 I turned her into Kenya, the kangaroo, in a second. Oh. You're the, you're the first person I'm admitting this to. Oh, okay. Very well. Yeah. So critique groups are just amazing. And then also, once you've been working on something for a while, set it aside. Uh, even if you can do it a couple months, like I'll, I usually have two or three new pieces I'm working on at a time. And once I get one, that first rough draft, which is just a bear to wrestle that thing down. But once I've got that wrestled down, set it aside, come back in a, a month or two. Boy, you can see things you didn't see before. You know, it's, um, of course, read current books, you know, reading, uh, go to the library, go to a bookstore, read the current picture books that are out there. But I would also say, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, don't write about something you think you should write about that would be popular that kids would like. Like, let's say you think, oh, construction vehicle books are really popular. I should write a book about them. But you're not interested. You don't care. It's going to come through in your writing and a particular, and also in um, nonfiction particularly. So only get those topics. Like, I, I let topics simmer with for a while. I have a, I always have a, a list of, of topics because I don't have enough time to write about everything I think of. But when, once I pick a topic, I'm going to be work researching it, working on it, getting that first draft down. That'll be a, about six months off and on of work. And if it sells, I'm with that book for the rest of my life. You know, then there's so only pick those topics. You are really you are really fascinated. Um, we have a, I have a book coming out later this year about the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the most powerful telescope ever sent into space and which has taken these beautiful pictures like this. But I space is a, is something I'm super interested in. So I there and this got very tedious, very detailed, very scientific engineering, but I loved every minute of it. But that's because I was fascinated about the topic. So don't do something you think you should do because it won't be any fun. <laughs> I guess those are the main main suggestions I would have. And don't give up. Oh, don't give up for sure. That's I okay, real quick. Astronaut Annie is a picture book I had written. Fictional tale, girl, a career day. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know. Um, kept getting rejected, 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 rejected. Put it away. I forgot about it. I've literally forgot about it. Then I was doing a book signing with an illustrator, something she said reminded, pulled it back out anyway, polished it, sold it. That book is, a, it, it ended up being sent to the space station where it was read by an astronaut. Ryan Reynolds read recently read it on his bedtime stories with Ryan. So here's something that I thought was never gonna see the light of day. It was many, many decades in process and it's had quite a, quite a little life now. <laughs> and hopefully inspired a lot of little girls to, go after their dreams of whatever they would want to be. Incredible. So this is a, a good place to say goodbye for now. We'll be back in a few months. And awesome. uh, Suzanne Slade, it's been wonderful to have you. How was that? It wasn't so bad, was it? No, Mel, you're, you're quite delightful to talk to. I gotta say, you are the man. I have to persuade my wife, but thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and I'm Mel Rosenberg. And I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network because I love meeting and interviewing wonderful, talented people like you. So, uh, Suzanne, thanks very much for being on the show. Uh, you're going to come out and come, go away and come back back. And we'll yeah, say I'll goodbye to everybody sure. else. Listen, if, run out and buy her books. Wave those new ones again so everybody can see them. Ones. Yes. And thank you, Mel, for inviting me. This was so oh. fun. And Thank you, Jennifer Burns, for, for introducing books. us.
Some days yeah. are yellow. Behold the octopus and Vera Rubin's book. Hi, shining star. Shining star. And you are the shining star, Suzanne Slade. You are. Thanks, Thanks Mel. Thanks so much. And we'll be back in a minute for, except for everybody else. Right. You and I got, so, we got to talk about the book we're going to write. Yeah. Absolutely. Bye, everybody else. Bye. Thanks.